you are in for a treat. Today, I have interviewed and discussed and talked with Bethany Wilkinson about motherhood and mental health. So how did I meet Bethany? So it was about 10 years ago, for sure, three or four kids ago for us both. Um, We were at Reedy Creek Park Nature Preserve, and our kids were playing in like the fort building section. They have all these sticks, and you can build like all these forts in the woods of the playground area, which I think they've redone that playground area now. Um, But it was her oldest at the time. He was only like nine or 10. I mean, now he's a full grown man, real estate agent. But he came over and introduced himself and was like, I noticed that we both have large families. My dad's whittling sticks. Can he whittle some sticks for your kids too? And it was like, absolutely. We'd never even experienced anything like that. So um, from there, our circles intersected in different homeschool activities like soccer and education nights. Um, But I fell in love with Bethany when I got involved on one of her her teams, her Plexus team. Plexus is the gut health company. And what I got a chance to really get to know her at that point. And what I loved and love about Bethany is she ran this team like a women's ministry. She very much was for her heart is for empowering women. Um, And she just breathes safe spaces. Um, She lives a life creating safe, loving spaces for people. One of my favorite things that she's done um, is she created a group called Connect to Inspire, where she would bring in um, leaders that she knows, community leaders in the area, and have them come in and talk to a group of eighth, or actually, I think it was ninth, 10th, and 11th graders about their career. And they would just tell their story of how they um, got into their career and, you know, just anything they wanted to share. And these teenagers sat around glued to every word these adults would say. So um, that's one of my favorite things she's done. She's also a certified midwife. She was the midwife for me um, that oversaw the birth um, of Boaz. And I learned so much from her. Um, I could that that would be literally a whole podcast series, and I'm so excited because I know she's working on some exciting projects empowering women with um, education in that realm. She's an educator. Everywhere she goes, she's passionately curious, um, and she's always learning. And you can't help but be excited about the stories and the things that she shares. Um, but she's such a great listener. You often have to get her to talk because she's often seen listening far more than she's seen talking. Um, She's a nature lover and a lover of people. And so today I am just really excited that I was able to record this conversation because conversations with her about mental health and motherhood and faith have been such a place of healing, a safe space to ask tough, to wrestle with tough questions. I heard a quote once that it's like, you know, we're not going to, I can't remember exactly how it went, but it was like, maybe we're not going to have all the answers, but maybe it's about finding people it's safe to ask these questions with. And she, she has been that for me so much. So I love her dearly and I am excited to share her with you. You may have also remember her voice from the Untamed podcast. She was the Freedom Warrior. If you haven't heard that yet, although I know many of you have because that had record numbers of downloads, um, but if you haven't heard it yet, you can also hear more from her in that podcast. And I'm actually excited. The Untamed Ladies will be back um, in a couple of weeks. Um, we're working on an episode with all four of us again because that was just way too much fun not to do again. So as always, thank you so much for listening. You are a gift. Welcome. 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 To celebrate. To celebrate. Holly. Welcome to celebrate story. With my mom. My mom. With my mom. With my mom. With my wife. Julie Wagner. Julie Wagner. Julie Wagner. Julie Wagner. Welcome back to Celebrate Story. I am so glad you're here. And I am really excited 
to have this conversation today with my friend, Bethany Wilkinson. Um, I've had so many conversations with her about mental health and motherhood. And I thought how perfect to be able to dig deep with her on a conversation when the podcast is focusing on mental health. So you and I have had so many conversations and we even launched into it before I even hit record on the microphone Mm -hmm. about mental health and motherhood. Mm -hmm. And I want to tell you a story and I want your feedback because you always give such, I don't know, you always make me think differently. Um, And you always seem to have, I don't know if it's your Enneagram fiveness, Hmm. but you always seem to be able to help me turn my brain on. Okay. (laughs) So (laughs) I so appreciate that. So I heard something recently and I want to know your perspective on this. Um, And this, this to me goes straight to the heart of mental health and motherhood. So I heard something and I've heard it many times before. There was a focus on first Corinthians 13 and a message I heard. And you know, the the patient, you know, love is patient, love is kind, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it goes through. And it was it was a beautiful, inspiring message, but then something hooked me. There was a part that it was like, okay, love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. And you know, if you're talking about something that you were wronged about, you know, five years ago, and it's still as fresh as the moment you heard it, that's not keeping a record of wrongs. Mm. And it's like immediately I was triggered because I thought about in my own life, how I would use that verse to Mm. spiritually abuse myself. I would be like, I am a bad Christian because I'm still in pain over this thing and I need to let it go. And there was no amount of white knuckling and letting go those things that I was having a very real trauma response. Mm. And so I am just curious about everything you would want to share in response to that of like, is that something you've experienced? Have you seen with other, you have so much experience being involved in the church as both a pastor's wife, Mm -hmm. a pastor's daughter, Mm -hmm. um, running (laughs) ministries out of your home, like 20, 20 (laughs) running from (laughs) from and running, running them in your home. I'm just curious, like, is, what are your thoughts on that? Like, and I guess that's spiritually bypassing what I was doing to myself Mm -hmm. of like, So I guess what I'm, I would love to hear you talk anything and everything you want to say about what do you think, why does it feel separate sometimes that to work on mental health is in combating Mm. with the spiritual rules, the unwritten rules and, and like, what, what are your thoughts on all that? Just anything you want to share? Oh man. Maybe that was too big of a question. My first thought is it's so dismissive coming from someone else to say like toward you love keeps no record of wrongs as though it's a directive like we talked about this the other day like if 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 you were in pain if you had a wound okay so that maybe that was a wrong from someone else or an experience or a circumstance and you had a wound and literally figuratively whatever jesus sits beside you in that pain my thought would not be from from what from what i believe to be true about jesus would his goal in sitting with you not be to sit with you with that wound to ask more about the wound and to want to heal the wound right but you've got to be aware that the wound is there Mm. Right. And then to be able to heal in order to even to be able to heal the wound like the the goal is healing. The goal is love. Right. And and that is Jesus and that is the gospel. (laughs) So for anyone, including ourselves, because we typically do that best to ourselves, but like whether it's the church or the whoever's behind the pulpit whoever's sharing the scripture, if they're saying that to you, like, can you imagine Jesus sitting down with you and your wound is bleeding and to say, well, love keeps no record of wrongs. Mm. How dismissive, Mm -hmm. right? So I think it depends on how you're hearing it, who you're hearing it from. But again, if if you're speaking to yourself, are, are you in the habit of dismissing your own pain? And where is there healing in that? Oh, that is so good. Because that I think that's the heart of the problem is when I hear that it activates a lifelong struggle mm. that I've had with sitting with my own pain. Yes. It's like I first am dismissing. I love those words. Like I'm being directive to myself and using 
this like toxic positivity. It's, yes. And okay. so someone saying it is just an echo of the, the cruel voice I've had. Yes. And so Julie and I also share this, which if this is not okay, we can edit this out, but we go to the same therapist. Is that okay? Yes, to say? absolutely. Okay. Okay. I don't know. Nothing is off the table. Okay. So, um, but she's helped me to recognize, okay, when, when did you first, when were you dismissed? Like, let's, let's go back to childhood, which I know some people are maybe think that's whatever. I don't even care what people think, but I know what kind of is going through people's minds when you start talking about psychology, but it's such a huge blessing. So anyway, um, but to go back to childhood, when were you dismissed? And then, you know, when maybe it was a caregiver and you go to that caregiver with pain, um, whether it's a scraped knee or, you know, someone hurt your feelings at school or whatever's going on. And that person, caregiver, or it could be a friend or whoever, dismisses you. And that happens, you know, over so many times and, you know, along through life. And then you just learn that pattern yourself of dismissing your own pain. Like you're not even worthy of bringing these things up. You think you're a burden or, you know, a lot of it. It's different for every person, Um, but you're only going to go to someone so many times when they dismiss your pain, then you realize there's really no point Mm -hmm. in continuing to go. And, And then we, it's a learned behavior that we do that to ourselves. We're even, we're unable to go to those that we love, that we should be able to go to. We should be able to be received by those closest in our lives, like that's intimacy, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but we dismiss our own pain to the point where we we don't even have much to go to others with because we've already decided that our pain is not worthy of recognizing, sharing. And so you have to wonder, like, how much does that rob us in our friendships and our relationships and mm. our marriages when yes. we're not even able to look within ourselves, which is another like church thing, right? It's like <laughs> um, the whole dismissing yourself. I mean, it's a thing. Like die to yourself. Yes. There's such a, because it seems like Facebook is listening. <laughs> of course, we all know this <laughs> because it's like that is such a hot button issue to me. This whole like there's this debate of like, oh, you know, there's on one side, people are like, no, the heart is deceitfully wicked. You have to mm. not listen to your heart. You know, you've got to die to yourself. And then you have you and I like fall in this idea of like you have we have to listen to our own pain mm. so God can heal it so we can not transmit more pain to others, but that we can like be transformed so by our pain yes. and like be healed by the love of God on a deep level so that we can pass it on. And it's like, right. why? Like, I don't. I don't know. I'm very drawn to that, like a magnet. And I've got, probably because I have so much more to learn on how to just listen, because there's there's definitely a visceral reaction in me when mm. I see someone maybe younger than me, like 10, 15 years younger, like being like, no, the heart's wicked. And you, mm. it's and I'm like, oh, I wish I could be this mature person that's mm. like, oh, I'm just I know God will meet them where they're at when they're at. But, right. it's, but I see myself is what it is, sure. Bethany. Yeah. I see myself and it feels like, I think the Enneagram 2 in me, the wanting to help, like it feels mm. like I just know I, it was easy for me to buy into church theology about women mm. because it dismissed women's voice because I was already dismissing my own voice. Sure. It felt yeah. so safe and so right. comfortable. Right. But I'm curious, do you, because you've worked with so many women, you've had so many different ministries Mm -hmm. that you've worked with so many different women. Do you think that, because I know we share those thoughts, but some friends of mine who did not grow up in the church Mm -hmm. were were so like curious and kind of enlightened by our untamed conversation Mm -hmm. and they didn't know that about Mm -hmm. the church. Like, do you think it's changing? And do you think those are ideas I'm just curious what you think about that, I guess. I guess I don't even have specific um, questions, just general reflections on that. That's interesting. Maybe elaborate on that some because I also had one person respond about that podcast with a different perspective on it, having not grown up in the church. Well, so 
her perspective was it I mean she just had no idea where we were coming from because in her mind her upbringing was total chaos and no foundation and then to hear that anyone could be harmed by the thing that helped her the most you know oh, so wow. so um so yeah, we, I mean that that was a good conversation, but I'm curious about your about yes. your conversations as well. Both of them had not grown up in the church, and so though they'd heard of this as a distant thing, it they had no clue, like and I've known them both for 10 years how much mm. that affected my psyche and mental health. And so it opened up some really beautiful conversations, but and I certainly don't want to um so those people are not in the church now. They are in the church oh, they now. Are, they no. are in the church. Both of them are in the church okay. now. They did, they okay. came to the church as adults. Yeah. And it was like, this was so interesting to them to hear that that was a thing. And I guess there's so many different, it's so tricky. Experiences and perspectives. Yeah. Yes. 100%. Yes. Sure. Which speaking of different experiences and perspective, and since we want to dig into mental health, I'm curious, tell me a little bit more about what you're learning in your mental health journey. Mm. Wow. Um, I think, uh, well, a few things. I am somewhat grieved that it took me so long to see a professional. I think um, for me in particular, and for those, I mean, a lot of you guys don't know the details of my story, but I I would say I dismissed my own um I mean, just where I was mental health wise for a long time, um, believing that, and I'm not sure where the belief came from, but again, you know, I grew up in the church and um, I don't know if it was just a theme in my home or just who we were surrounded with, but that depression was a choice and that godliness, you know, joy was fruit. And so, you know, something is wrong with you if you um if you have anxiety or depression or you know that it that it really was more of a um a choosing what you focused on. Um and then in my adult life um not even being able to put my finger on exactly what I was dealing with because I was dismissing myself. I felt like, you know, I had people even saying, how is your prayer life? Or like, what is, you know, how's your relationship with Jesus? Like people would say these things, assuming that it, you know, they had this answer. And to me at the time, it was like drowning that is literally how I felt, drowning and someone told me to swim harder. That's mm. how that felt. So it's like you're drowning, your mouth is barely above the water, you're gasping for breath, and someone asks you to swim harder. Like, here's <sighs> something else you should do. This is something else you should be doing. What a great do metaphor. Do harder. And you I know? had the visual when you did that, I had a visual if someone had broken arms while they were drowning, mm, we wouldn't arms. ask them about their prayer life. <laughs> Right. That would be so cruel. It right. would be so like, it's shaming to me. And I just don't think that was the heart of Jesus at all. I I can't imagine him standing on a boat and saying, if you would just pray harder, Bethany, have you, how's your, you know, how, how is our relationship? Oh, As he it, stands there watching, you know, like watching someone struggle. Is that what we, that's that what, what we're doing. That's what we're doing. You know? And it, it feeds into me for me. And I don't know if I'm reading my own experiences into this, but it feeds into me this like behave theology mm. is what I took away from a lot of the growing up years of church. And even into my twenties and thirties, it's about behaving and about being good enough. Mm. They did, said you were saved you know, by grace, but it, there was a lot of rules and yeah. it wasn't about like, and it was about truth was something that you held and that you could grasp. Mm. And then if you did these things and read your Bible and then yeah. everything would be okay. Right. And it's like, 
where is the conversation for you're doing those things and things are not okay? Yes. And then it's more dismissal. And then it, and there's still the wounds are still bleeding. And I think for me now, you know, just giving myself permission to spend the money on therapy, to believe that I'm worthy of healing for myself, not just to say, you know, if, okay, I recognize where some of my wounds are bleeding onto those that I love the most. And then so, so I need to, I need to work through some things, p- potentially some things that I don't even know I should address, you know, whether it's childhood or whatever. Um, but initially it was like, I have to do this for my kids and for, and for our relationship and for my husband. And then in time it was like, why, why didn't I believe this is something Kim has helped me recognize. Why didn't I believe that I was worthy of healing? Preach to me. You know, like God believes that. I didn't even believe that he that was not even a response that I had learned could be of him. Everyone I knew in my life at the time just wanted to make it better or were concerned or, you know, whatever. And again, I dismissed my own feelings. I didn't know how bad it was until it was so obvious. And then now, you know, anyone listening, it's like you have children and they grow and then they, as they become adults, you know, they start giving you feedback. <laughs> Honest. <laughs> Honest fe- it's coming. Especially in the teenage years. Right. But man, it's like they, you know, it's the so- honest feedback about how they feel um and whether they felt dismissed. And you're just like, oh my goodness. You know, like, of course, because I was dismissed, I'm dismissing myself. I'm a pro at dismissal. And so then we've got another situation, another generation of when people have real emotional needs or wounds and we just say how's your prayer life or how's your you know are you re- are you reading your bible this is a sp- this is a spiritual issue you know like i'll pray for you or whatever but it, but it, in a sense when someone is drowning when someone is has the wound and they're bleeding and and you say those things not saying all the time maybe that is healing for some but I know that for me, it felt like someone was turning their back toward me. And I know now that was never, that was never Jesus. He never turned his back. I didn't even know how to approach him at the time because all of that rhetoric created more of a gap, I feel like. Mm. So, you know. I want to go, I want to go back to something you said. That was all so rich, and I'm so glad it's recorded so I can hear it again. <laughs> this is so hel- – it's so helpful. It's so so interesting. But you were talking about I didn't – you know, the reasons you went to therapy was so that you could be better for your mm. children, and then you've come to find a place of like, no, I need to go to therapy because my needs matter and mm. that I want to be better for myself. Absolutely. And that right. is such a like – such an in- inspiring shift mm. and so relatable and one I have not quite figured out yet because it's my default. I remember saying once, um, you know, oh, I just don't want to do that because it's selfish. And I was challenged by someone. They were like, you know, men never sit around worried that they're selfish. Mm. And I was like, isn't that so interesting? How is it fair? Like, I don't want to make sweeping generalizations, but in my experience in the church, it seems like that's like the worst thing Mm. for a Christian woman to be. Like we will do anything, but be selfish. Mm. Like it's like, that is just, I mean, mean, there could not be a worse insult maybe, Yeah. but it's like, it's so insane because I heard Joyce Meyer say recently, I used to listen to her a lot and I, I don't really catch her as much anymore, not for any particular reason. But she was like, if you do not take care of yourself, this is a woman in her 70s. Mm. If you do not take care of yourself, you will eventually not be able to take care of anyone else. And I was Mm -hmm. like, what straight shooting wisdom? Like, And we're so afraid of that tension, it seems, Mm. because there's so much die to yourself. And then we're so afraid. That's like the perfect thing to say to someone who's in a trauma response that's already dismissing themselves all the time. Sure, It's like, yes, which then makes it hard to even own for me. I'm anxious yeah. or I'm despondent or mm-hmm. I'm depressed. And mm-hmm. it's like, but it. I love the way you said that it bleeds out on everyone. Mm-hmm. It does. <laughs> but I can't, I would never ignore broken ankles. Right. <laughs> Just... Right. And we don't, we don't value mental health in our culture and the church definitely does not help. <laughs> so, you know, 
I saw something recently, probably because it's like Mental Health Awareness Month, but it's talking about, um, you know, if you if you were walking around with a gaping wound, you would go to the ER, you know, but like emotionally, we completely, completely dismiss our emotional wounds. Um, so, yeah, I think it just has a lot to do with, you know, just people believing like, OK, um the Bible is the answer. Jesus is the answer. So I'm not saying is not true, but like we all use tools, right? Therapy is a tool and it really does help like peel back those layers and just, okay, where are these, where are these wounds? Like we've covered them up for so long and they're still bleeding. There's not enough band-aids in this world for some of those wounds. And we need to just get all, rip all of that off mm-hmm. acknowledge that and start to heal that with real like psychology is so amazing i mean i if i liked school i would go right back like i just love everything kim does but i mean i have really experienced a lot of healing and it just it makes me sad what what people you know people's ideas on counseling and therapy. I mean, I even ha- sometimes still have a response, to be honest. I hear somebody's in counseling. I hear someone's in therapy. We automatically assume something is wrong with them that's not wrong with everyone else because mm. not everyone else is going. You know, so it must be something really wrong. Yes, with every single person, <laughs> right? There's yes. just some brave ones that are willing to admit, like, I am not going to walk around anymore with these wounds like this it's serious enough to go and I'm worthy of the healing. That is so true. Like we're all broken. We're all, Gerald May says in Addiction and Grace, he's like, we're all addicted to something. And I think Mm -hmm. it's so easy to be addicted to the narrative of I'm fine Mm -hmm. because it's efficient. Mm -hmm. And we love, I love, I love efficiency. Mm -hmm. I I always battle with a feeling of a scarcity of time. Mm -hmm. And so it takes time. Yeah. Yeah to find the roots of the pain and the problems and it takes time to be committed to healing it. And it's vulnerable to admit that I don't have the answers. Like you have to sit in uncertainty of not knowing how to fix it or heal it within yourself. That is, that is, it does bring up so many thoughts and so many emotions. What do you think is, um, what do you, do you think things are changing? Like Steve and I were talking about, Mm that it's becoming more acceptable to get therapy. Do you think things are changing with our generation? Like, I feel like our generation has more space to do this than sure. like our parents' generation. Do you see it yeah. as changing? Yeah, I think a lot of things change for the better over time. And I do believe, you know, social media has its pros and cons, um, but it has opened up so many opportunities to connect with other people and um, get messages out to a broader audience. So, you know, you and I and our and some of our friends, we we read the same books, we follow the same podcasts. People are doing these um, massive intakes, like Sheila Gregoire and the Great Sex Rescue. You know, she interviewed or did that um, whatever it was, twenty thousand women. Not an interview. The research yes. that she did. On 20,000 women in their sex lives, right? Yes. And and how their belief systems are shaping so much. So, and, you know, anyway, that maybe would not have been possible 20 years ago, right? So, So I'm just thinking like we are, we have so much more access to good information and connection. Like that is one of the ways that I found Kim was someone shared a live that she did. And so I got to know her and, you know, kind of, I guess, was able to like read her vibe just through listening to a lot of her lives. And then she has a podcast. Mm -hmm. So I was able to, you know, listen to her um, for hours through that uh, before I was able to get in with her. And so I felt like I I knew where she was coming from. I, I knew the the types of things that she would be using to work with me. Um, So it was different than just opening up the yellow pages, like in your old 
uh, telephone book and just looking through it's names. So true. That's so true. Right? So, so maybe that's part of it. We can um, do more background research, sure. which gives us a level of comfort and safety. Yes. And I love that you went to, when you were talking about the great sex rescue mm -hmm. studies or research, yeah. how that would not, that just would be mind blowing, I think, for our parents, something right. like that. But I think you hit on something I'd love to dig on and camp out on as we sort of come to the, the closing chapter. How do you think mental health, like you've read that book, mm. I haven't read that book, but mm. I've heard some of her interviews. How do you think a woman's mental health and s her sex life, like right. that is such a um, taboo, not spoken about thing, but mm -hmm. I think we both feel okay yeah. talking about that. Yeah, yeah. But it's like that to me, I mean, I'll just start personally. It's like when you're in a place of brokenness mm. that there's, you're like not at all open to this, this source of aliveness and play and joy. Sure. And if you're taught to dismiss your own needs. <laughs> right. No, 100 <laughs> percent. So I'd yeah, love to hear your thoughts on that. So, um, yeah, her book is very eye opening. The Great Sex Rescue, Sheila Gregoire, and she has a po she has a podcast, Bare Marriage podcast. And then she has um, she has another book her and her husband just just wrote. Well, hers is like revised from something she wrote before. And he and he just wrote a book. But anyway, um a lot of my thoughts on this probably come more from Jordan Wiggins, who has the Pleasure Principles podcast, and she wrote the book, The Pink Canary. So I think all of those resources are absolutely excellent when you're, you know, if you want to explore this topic more. And of course, like it's a it's a recent, somewhat recent passion of mine. So I feel like I could have like 15 episodes on this. So um, but with Jordan Wiggins, she talks, and it's called the pleasure principles because, um, you know, for women, there's kind of like the gas pedal and the brakes, right? So if you're giving, 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 giving sacrificially, and you're worried about dentist appointments and you're, and um, who needs shoes and who needs braces and, you know, how are we going to pay for groceries? And, um, you know, like all of your energy is moving outward. You know, all the arrows are pointing out towards everyone else all day long. Those are actually breaks on your libido. So, so we've got all these breaks happening. Um, you can barely find time for a shower. You can barely take care of yourself. Like you can't even pee alone, guys. We know we, every woman, every mother listening to this podcast knows what I'm talking about. You've got people banging down the door. So you don't even, you barely have time to take care of yourself. All your energy arrows are pointing outward. Um, and those are all breaks on your libido. So, so by the end of the evening, you know, if you've found no time to put some energy arrows towards yourself, right, then there's really not a whole lot else to give. Like you said earlier, I mean, that it translates into sex. Like you said, um, if you're, what did you say about if you're always giving out, you don't have anything else you'll to certainly give. certainly never Sure. You'll eventually not be able to take others. But yes. I love the arrow metaphor. That's awesome. Yeah. So it's not, I mean, it's not cut and dry. Like every single person is not the same. For the most part, um, that's how our brains work. And so we're constantly putting on the brakes toward our pleasure all day long. And then we're supposed to just hop in the bed and, you know, full steam ahead. And it's just very difficult um, for women. And we blame our hormones. Um, which sometimes that's an issue, but for the most part, it's not. So, you know, we, we blame our hormones. We think something is wrong with us. Um, and it creates even more of a divide because then our husband is may potentially hurt that we don't desire him, that we don't desire sex, you know, and then it becomes this whole cycle and it's really kind of difficult to get out of. And, Spending time with so many women over time, um, you know, it's just become a burden on me. And I have I have been there, too. So it's like, you know, women are just like, I really could probably go the rest of my life without sex. And, and you're just like, dang. Like, and I remember saying that to myself. And it wasn't my husband. It, it truly was like, like, wow on the brakes over here. Like, my life is continual stress and cortisol mm. <laughs> and not enough pleasure. And so it was just that part was really difficult. So 
Um, so yeah, I think self-care has a lot to do with it and just making that decision that like, hey, this is kind of unfair. Like, okay, this is how our brain works, brains work. We need to sit here with this for a while. And like, again, like going to therapy, it's like, okay, what do I like? What do I want? Am I worthy of asking for it? Like, can I make this about me? Why does it have to be about everyone else? Um, and it's not that difficult for guys. And for girls, I mean, for women, there's usually a, you know, like a, there's a lot of psychology there, you know? So, um, so yeah, believing that you're worthy of, you know, a great sex life and like figuring it out. Like it just takes, it takes time. But that whole Jordan Wiggins thing is like, you know, um, prioritizing your pleasure throughout the day. Make sure you've got some windows in there um, where you're, you know, pushing the gas pedal more than the brakes. I love that. And I, it's neat to hear you summarize that because having a friendship with you, I see you doing that more and more. Mm -hmm. I see you prioritizing barefoot walks in the woods and grabbing a coffee and enjoying the coffee. And I mean, I could list enjoying sunsets. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, I see you doing that in your life, putting more pleasure in. Right. Which again, going back to the church conversation, as long as I, you know, operated of a mindset that I was closer to God, the more that I sacrificed myself for everyone else, Mm. there's no space in that mindset for lots of, you know, pressing the gas. Like, because that was the opposite of what we believed at the time was bringing us closer to God, which mm. it just sounds it's so like, crazy to me now. But yes, it's like we spiritually abused ourselves. It goes back to the the castle mm. metaphor. Yeah, we thought we were building. You had said once to me yes. in a like late night conversation after ICU talks, which maybe that should be the final thing we hit too after this. But yeah, a late night conversation after ICU talks. You and I were both super inspired, hearing vulnerable, messy stories of hope and. You and I were talking about all these decisions we'd made for so many years, Mm. and you said the mic drop. You were like, we thought we were building a castle, and we looked around, and it was a prison. Right. It was like like a blueprint. I mean, you you get these books, and you hear these things, and the whole culture is saying like, oh, A and B equals C, you know, do all of these things. And so we've got our blueprints, and we're like (laughs) spending our whole lives and, you know, basically like brick by brick building up this, what we believed was going to turn out like a castle. And then you turn around, there's no door. There's no way out. <laughs> We're trapped. <laughs> right? And it was our own wow. hands. We yes. did it to ourselves, which then is also the most devastating news is also the best news. Because if we built it, we can tear it down. Yeah. It's like we can take it down brick by brick, which is what we're doing here, right? Yes. What we're doing when we go yeah. to ICU Talks. What is ICU Talks, mm. ICU Talks meant to you? Like what are... What is it? Why is it important? Why do you uh, go? What are the literally stories? It gave me chills when you said that. Which, which is part? So, just I see you talk. I see you talk. Thinking about it. So our therapist Kim is. Um, what what is she? Is she runs She's it? She's the, the founder and executive director. Okay, founder and executive director of I see you talks. Um, which is uh, what Tuesday of the? Is it always the, the third, third Tuesday, Tuesday of the okay. month? See, I don't even know, but I just, <laughs> I just have it on my calendar. So, um, yeah. So. One Tuesday a month, the third Tuesday of the month, she brings different speakers in. Next month, Julie will be speaking at ICU Talks. So I'm so excited, excited and terrified. And people audition. And then um, and then the board decides, I guess, who is able to speak. They have three speakers each time. And the speakers are normal people. That's the number one thing that I love is that, you know, they meet in a church but it, it is not like this preachy sermon type um, experience. You've got people sharing their stories and you just feel more connected to humanity, I feel like. I in totally that, agree. In that space. And people are sharing hard things and we can learn from one another's stories, but we feel connected versus... You know, in any other setting, sometimes when someone is on the stage and one person has the microphone 
and it's almost like a like a authority situation. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got all the answers. Here's ten steps how to be perfect like me. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Uh, but this is like real and raw, and I love the opportunities that she gives people to share their stories, and I I just um, really appreciate what she does there. Yes, so. me too. And it's the mission, I think, is to end the stigma against mental health. It's right. like a place to be okay, not being okay. And that has been such a healing spot for me. Mm-hmm. So, okay, tell me. Okay, so I wanted to add that. Um, you know, lives, one way in which I think we dismiss ourselves is that we, and again, I think this is another belief that just comes from church culture, but like that we should be happy. We should be content with what we have. Like, like I'll dismiss myself saying, I, but I, but I have such a loving, caring husband. Look at my seven healthy children. Wow, we have a house, a roof over our heads. All of our physical needs are met, you know, and like whatever, whatever we say to ourselves. Suffering. Sure. Like the, the like dance I of have I have no, no right. reason to be down because look at all that I'm blessed with. Mm. But it's another way of dismissing ourselves. Yes, we can be thankful for those things and still recognize that there are some pretty serious emotional wounds or emotional gaps in our relationships that are worthy of taking the time and effort to work towards something better. Preach to me. So I just wanted to add that. And I really do love my husband, love my kids and all the things and 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 love life in those ways. But when I go to therapy and I start to talk like that, Kim is like, okay, you see that chair over there? Put all of that in that chair. (laughs) This, during this hour, you're going to focus on what you really need to get out and say. You can focus on your pain here. You're not going to take all those, your parents were great. Awesome. They're over there in that chair. (laughs) So in this hour, you get to sit with all the ways in which this or that was painful. That's so good because I do that to myself. It is so, you feel guilty focusing on this one thing, but it's like going back to our prison castle. It's like, oh, we can't possibly complain. Look, mm -hmm. there's there's a roof over our head and everyone's here and safe and happy. Mm -hmm. Let's just focus on this, which is also for me a form of not just dismissal, but denial. Mm -hmm. It's denial. Like- Which I then the worst is, is when I've caught doing this to my own children. Oh, for sure. (laughs) Like this morning, one of my kids was like, ah, because I go to grocery store on Friday. And I'm like, I hate trying to find something to eat on Fridays. There's nothing at all to eat. And I launched into a dismissive speech about Mm. starving children. (laughs) (laughs) It's what we do. It is like such a journey to see your own contradictions and to forgive yourself enough to try again. Yes. To keep and, trying again. And that's the thing is we can't, I don't think we can even recognize how we, you know, it's like we've got all these band-aids over our own wounds and we've just got a box of band-aids and we're just handing them out to everybody else like with our dismissal. Oh, cover that up. Oh, cover. Band-aids for right? everyone. Band-aids for everyone. Band-aids for everyone. There's a title. Recently, I was thinking about how just being honest with my own pain is the first step. And I tend to beat myself of, oh, I shouldn't be here again. I shouldn't be here again. There's no reason I should be. I've done all this work. I've, you know, done steps A through Z. Everything should be solved Mm. with my mental health. Like, Mm. and it's like, no, I've read all the books. I've done all the therapies. There's like such a perfectionistic beating myself up. Nope. Let me just be happy. Let me dismiss my own pain. Let me deny it. But like the light comes in Mm. the moment that I I just accept it is. Mm. It is. And I think you've said very recently about depression isn't linear. Mm -hmm. So could you talk more about that? Yeah. It's not that somebody, and I'm just, based on my own experience, it's like, it's not, that's not who I am. You know, but 
and it's not always the same, but there can be something that uh, it's like rips open that wound and it's like a, a, res- a trigger or response. And then you find yourself spiraling downward and the spiral may not go as deep as it did last time. And you may recognize it early and talk to who you need to talk to and to process it out or whatever. But, um, but knowing that, that there is, that it's going to be, it's going to be okay. Okay, this is this is a dip, or this is a really low low, and I've been here before, and I've made it out. Mm-hmm. Um, and what does that look like? What does that making it out look like? And most recently, um, I knew that I had a therapy appointment coming up, and it was like, oh, I could almost see Kim on the shore with like the little life raft, you know, just ready to to toss it out because I knew that in processing it with her and to identify like what, where was, where was that trigger? And it never has to do with the actual person that said something or felt something at the time, but, but it's like a whole working through process of digging deep and recognizing, okay, this is where that initial wound was. And what do we need? What did that person at that time need? And how do we go back and give her what she needed at seven or at 13 or whatever? And what, when she initially felt like that, what was that need? Can you give that to her now? Can you go back and and give that to her now? And then walking out of that scenario at 40, feeling seen, soothed, safe, secure, because I went back and and dealt with that initial wound at seven or 13, but it was like, that was a lifeline. That was a processing through. Um, I love that you point out that it's not linear and extrapolate out what that looks like. Cause it's, it's so relatable. It, you also mentioned something about the pleasure principle. Mm. Tell me more about what that pleasure principle, it was a book, the book by Jordan Wiggins, yeah. I think, but okay. you also talked about, you referenced about how when you hear people and you're not happy for their happiness. Like, cause yes. it's like when you're in that state of you've spiraled so low, like yes. I'm at the bottom of the spiral I, and yes. I might know there's a lifeline coming, but I'm still at the bottom of the spiral beating myself sure. up for the. But I remember feeling, I remember at one point being in a low place and everyone that I saw that was sharing happy things, I was certain that they were lying or fake or, you know, like, like, they're just, they're making that up. There's no way that they are genuinely happy. I couldn't even believe that for anyone else. Um, but then a sense of like, of jealousy, there's been times of that where the belief that, you know, when someone else, um, I don't know, whatever, has a, takes their whole family to Hawaii or like whatever. <laughs> And you're and you're in a low place. Um, Jordan Wiggins, you know, talks about like if you're seeing everyone else's um, happy times through a lens of jealousy, you're not prioritizing your own pleasure. Ooh. And so it almost gives mm. you like a practical thing to, okay, let me just look back within myself. Like, am I giving myself enough energy arrows back towards me? Um, because when I am prioritizing my own pleasure, I can genuinely be happy for everyone else's successes. so good. So, and that's a vulnerable thing. Like no one wants to admit that there's potential to be jealous over what someone else has, but we do it. It's true. And I love that you said that because it's like the rules are in Christianity. You do not, you're not jealous. So we shut it down. We dismiss it. Yes. We dismiss it and deny it. there's something there. Yes. And it's a red flag. And if we're told not to look within (sighs) ourselves and not to trust ourselves, then we're ignoring red flags. Yes. When it's easily taken care of. And it, and I'm a girl who has a very hard time making a difficult a, a decision. Like I make simple decision decisions difficult and jealousy by actually listening to my jealousy. It's mm. actually helped me figure out what do I really want? What do you need? I got really yeah. jealous of people with microphones back in the summer, like yeah. angrily jealous. Yeah. And it's like, well, I can fix that. That tells me what do I you really need. want? Yeah, yeah. I have a need to talk and to be heard. Yes. And so 
I think that's so powerful because you on the- could have stayed in that space for the rest of your life. Yes. Upset yes. Upset that everyone else had a microphone and you didn't. Yes. And being jealous of other people's microphones and then beating myself up for not being a good enough Christian mm. for being jealous. Mm. Like, but yet there was this like gift on the other side of sure. actually going through the I had to tunnel. Your purpose. Yes. I mean, it was like, hey, like a little, you know, blinking red light, like, hey, there's something here. There's something here. And it's something that you needed to do that that is benefiting so many people. But like whatever you want to call it. I mean, it's like, of course, you know, Satan, the enemy, whatever you want to say, it's like, of course, you'd want to keep you in that space. Yes. Like, let's not address this wound. <sighs> Ignore and yourself. Just keep, <laughs> just yeah, stay in this jealous bad. cycle. Beat yourself up for being right, jealous. Right, right. Oh, which does nothing to get rid of the awful feeling of jealousy. It just continues. No. Yeah. It continues. In closing, is there anything else you want to add? Thank you so much Man. for offering your your thoughts yeah. and your heart and your passions today. I, I'm really grateful. Yeah. I mean, I would just say that I struggled for a long time. Um mentally feeling very alone and I just want people to know that you know maybe listening to this that you're not alone and you are worthy of taking the steps towards healing for you Uh, whatever that looks like reaching out to friends finding safe people to talk with that aren't offering solutions wrapped up in a pretty package Ugh. not asking you yes. to do more not you know just whatever the suggestion is mm. and it, they may mean well um and also that just you know it's okay to say it doesn't have to be a facebook post but like to say to someone who is safe that you're having a hard time and if you if you don't have anyone in your life that is a safe person for you to say that to just evaluate like like where is all this dismissal coming from and what is that belief system um, that's there that's creating so much dismissal? Am I dismissing myself mm. in this? Um, but just, you know, to be able to take steps towards healing for you, it is 100% worth it. Um, yeah. That's so good. That's so good. No!